lies, I am going to rip up your certification. Which, if you don't know, a pastor is certified to be a pastor of the LCMS. And the reason he says that, based on this text, is because if you say that, it means you did not handle that text properly. You missed the entire point. So Jesus has been doing a lot of preaching and teaching. He's been going about cleansing lepers, making healing paralytics, casting out demons. He's been doing these incredible signs, and he just got done teaching a whole series of parables. So naturally, he is exhausted. He's tired. So they're on the boat, and they're sailing across the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is asleep when a storm stirs up. The disciples become extremely terrified. And you have to understand, this has got to be a pretty bad storm for them to be afraid, scared that they might die. Because you have to remember, for some of these disciples, fishing was their profession. They've definitely seen a storm or two. And so for them to be this afraid, it's probably pretty bad. And so what they did is they... They're trying to keep the ship afloat. But Jesus, he's asleep. And so they go down to him and they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Hear those opening words. Do you not care? That very sentence suggests one simple thing. They don't trust him. They don't trust Jesus. They think he's just asleep and lazy. He just doesn't feel like helping them. And let's face it, when our life is, when there's chaos going on around you, your brain does not think very clearly. Do you not care? They've seen his compassion at work. When the de demon-possessed people came to him, he cast out those demons. When there was a leper who came to him, if you know the history of the leprosy, this is really significant. He doesn't just say, you're clean, you're healed. He touched them to cleanse them. <clears throat> people who would go years and years without anyone ever touching them, that is how he chooses to heal them. The paralytic, the paralytic who is pretty much destined to die, he tells him, take up your mat and walk. Oh, and before he did that, he forgave him his sins. Which, by the way, that whole little thing was the evidence that he is God in the flesh. So they see in the evidence who he is. He's the Christ. He's God in the flesh, and he's definitely shown compassion. And yet, what do they ask? Do you not care that we are perishing? And also, how much faith, lack of faith it's got to be that they actually think that they're perishing. Do they really think that they are the chosen twelve? Jesus' chosen apostles. Were they really going to die on a random boat in the middle of the sea during a random storm? Is that where Jesus was going to die? The Christ? In fact, if they knew their, New Test their Old Testament, they should know the answer to that. He's going to die in much more brutal fashion. It will not be from a storm. So based upon who Jesus is, based upon God's word, they should have known that they're going to get out of this. But yet, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus, probably a little bit grumpy, because for one, he, woke, he was woken up from a nap. Let's face it, we wake up, we're woken up from a nap that we're not ready to wake up from. We're grumpy. 
But to make it even more so, he's grumpy by their lack of faith. He tells the storm, peace, be still. Or literally says, be muzzled. And the wind ceases. There's a great call. The storm obeyed his command. He says to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Because that is at the root of it. They don't have faith. They don't trust. So when people... And I'm, you might have even heard that statement that I began with. That God promises to calm all the storms in your lives. Maybe you've heard that before. That is such a dangerous teaching. Because here's the reality. When you have storms, those metaphorical storms stir up in your life. Maybe it's a storm of a cancer diagnosis. And battling and battling and battling. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like there is any hope. Or maybe it's some, a relationship in your life. With a friend. With a spouse. Things are not just going the way you would like them to be. And it seems to be an ongoing fight. An ongoing battle. And it doesn't seem like it's ever going to end. I'm mindful of when I was working at a Methodist Hospital in Des Moines, I was uh, doing a, sub, a summer chaplaincy program, or intern chaplaincy. And I remember hearing of a girl who was in the children's, in Blank's Children's. And this girl had a rare skin disease where she had, she had to come in, I think it's like once a month, to have ban her bandages removed and replaced. And every time it did, it removed her skin. And she'd have to get rebandaged, and that skin would slowly grow back, only to be removed the next time that they had to change it. And that is a condition she will live with her entire life. Tell somebody in that situation, oh, God's going to calm the storms in your lives. See, if, I, if somebody goes and tells you that, you're going to sit there and you have something going on in your life, whether it be big or small, and you're going to say, you told me that God, God said that he'll calm my storms, but look at it. Look at what's going on. It's not going away. Do you, you can't help but shout, do you not care that I am perishing as we scream to our Lord Scream to our God, do you not care? I thought you were going to calm all of my storms. The problem is, is that Jesus never promised that. There are those out there who tried to promise it. And by large, the ones who spread that teaching, they teach it because they know you'll give them more money as you hear what you want to hear, whether it's true or not. The storms, the pro truth is that Jesus said, there will be tribulation. He promised it. He said, no greater servant, no servant is greater than his master. If you, they, he, they persecuted him, they will persecute you. Jesus promised suffering. But see, the point of this is not that the storms will get calmed. In fact, for all we, we don't know, if it's kind of one of those good what if questions. If they had never woken him, would he have calmed the storm? Would he, he make, would they have just had to go through it? Who knows? Maybe he would have woken up eventually and calmed it. We don't know. The only thing we do know, based on the Old Testament, is they're going to get through that storm because Jesus is in the boat with them. And 
that's what they miss. And that is what we miss when we go to this idea that the storms will always be calmed. What did Jesus say before he ascended into heaven? Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. What they missed is who is in the stern with them. Jesus is in there. He is with them in the midst of it. Because he was in the, with them in the midst of it, they can trust that he is going to see them through to the end. He, and who is he? He's the one who could tell a storm to be quiet, and it's quiet. Any of you can do that? I can't. I can't, I can't always get my computer to work when I want it to. Good luck with telling a storm to do something. He calmed the storm. With, by his word, he spoke everything into existence. And when he was arrested, when he was betrayed, when he was beaten, he was tortured, and he was led to death by crucifixion, by that death, could, should have been his defeat, but it ended up bringing victory for the world, bringing forgiveness, life, and he rose from the grave, conquering death, Conquering the devil, conquering sin. That who, that's who is in the stern with them. And that is who is with you to the very end of the age. Do you ever pay attention to our liturgy? I don't know if you, okay, this is one of those things I like about the old, you, remember the, you know the old TLH service or Divine Service 3? Three times in that service, you hear this phrase from me. Or whoever is doing the liturgy. The Lord be with you. Right? Now the first time you hear it is right before the reading of the scriptures. It's a reminder, it's a confession, that when, as you hear God's word, he is with you in his word. Second time you hear it is right before the Lord's Supper. Because who is in the bread? Who is in the wine? It is the body and blood of our Savior Jesus whom you receive. So the Lord is with you in the reception of that supper. And then there is a third time you hear it. And that's right at the end of the service. And that's, what, that's something that's unique to Divine Service 3. Is it's always at the end of the service as well. The Lord be with you. It is letting you know that as you go out in your vocation, you know, your jobs, your callings, whether it be as wherever it may be that you're working, even if that means being retired, being a grandparent, a parent, a sibling, a student in school, whatever it may be, the Lord is with you through what he has called you to do. He is with you in everything that happens in your life. He is with you. And do you know why you can say that? Because all the way at the very beginning of the service, you hear the... In fact, sometimes... And I, gotta, I think I need to do this a little bit more often. But sometimes, the first words of the service is not a hymn. In fact, our liturgy is designed that traditionally the very first words of the liturgy is... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It is, and we don't say, we make our beginning. When I admit there are pastors that do that, it's like nails on a chalkboard. I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're, making, you're making a bad theological declaration when you do that. And it's because people don't like that it starts the way it does. They're like, there should be more to the sentence. But, no, you say in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one, you're recognizing that you gather in the name of the triune God, but also that as baptized children, you are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as Galatians says, Paul writes, 
that all of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on, have been clothed in Christ. So as a baptized child of God, you could gladly say that the Lord is with you in the midst of storms. Yes, they're scary. They're lonely. They're heartbreaking. But he is with you all the way through it. And as Paul writes, God does work for the good of all those whom he has chosen. You can say, I am baptized. He's going to lead me through this. Yes, that means ultimately it is going to lead to death. One day we will taste death. And guess what? When that happens, the ultimate storms, the sin, death, and the devil will be no more. And by the way, there will be no storm, no trials, no tribulations. He has promised to see us through. He has promised to be with us, to give us strength in the midst of these trials. He is with you all the way. In him may we trust. To him may we look. Because indeed he has overcome sin, death, and the devil. He has overcome the world. Take heart, trust, have faith in him. To him be all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace, peace, and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep you in the one true faith, to life everlasting. Amen.